You are watching Economum Tfia, the unofficial broadcaster of economics for South African students. This episode concludes Chapter 4 on measuring the performance of the economy. It is Part 4 of 4, and we will be looking at the other measures of the performance of the economy. We've been spending a lot of time on economic growth, but there's still price stability, the balance of payments, inequality, and unemployment to consider. First up is unemployment, and it is one of the biggest challenges facing the South African economy. Before we can talk about the implications of unemployment or the policies related to unemployment, the first step is to measure it. We start out with the working age population. That's everyone between 15 and 65 years. Then we take out the, those that are economically inactive. Those are people who are not available to work, for example, students, housewives, and people in prison. And you can also subtract those that are available to work but are not searching for work anymore, the discouraged workers. What you're left with is the labor force or the economically active population. They are divided into two parts, those that are employed and those that are unemployed. Have a look at the definition here of unemployment. People who are available to work and have taken active steps to look for work but have been unable to find it. The unemployment rate is calculated as follows. The number of unemployed people divided by the labor force multiplied with 100. Let's have a look at some South African numbers. In our case, the total of the population who falls in the category of being economically active is approximately 32 million people. Of those, 17 million is economically active, which means that our labor force participation rate is 54.1%. The table then goes on to show you a disaggregation, firstly, of those that are not economically active. There are approximately 2 million discouraged workers and 12 million other people who are not available to work at the moment. Of course, a large share of them are still younger than 15 years and at school. Having a look at the employed groups, you'll see that there are approximately 9 million people in formal employment in South Africa, where agricultural, formal and informal employment is at just over 600,000 jobs. The informal sector employs just over 2 million people. In total, the unemployed are approximately 4 million. As I've said, unemployment is one of the key challenges facing the South African economy, and we'll return to these issues when we discuss the labor market in a later chapter. Another macro goal is price stability. Instability is caused by inflation, and inflation is defined as a sustained increase in the general price level. Thus, if only the price of one or a few products increase, that is not inflation, only when it's sustained over time and an increase in the general price level. The effect of inflation is to reduce the buying power of money. This is one of the key macro variables and specifically it's the aim of the South African Reserve Bank to preserve the buying power of the RAND. There are different ways of measuring inflation and we are having a look at the consumer price index as one such a method. The index represents the prices of a representative basket of consumer goods and services. Now let's have a look at how this is calculated. The measurement that goes into the CPI works as follows. The Statistic South Africa determines a basket of goods and services that the average household consumes. They do this through the Income and Expenditure Survey. The next step is to add some weights to the different products that you consume. This is based on the proportion of the income that you spend on this product. For example, you could experience in a single year a 10% increase in the price of rice as well as a 10% increase in the price of fuel. These cannot be equally weighted in the inflation rate since you spend a much smaller portion of your total spending on rice than you do on fuel. And fuel needs a heavier weight in the calculation of the average inflation rate. The calculation of the inflation rate uses a very specific formula, the Lasperis formula, and 
It's also done in relation to a specific base year. The prices are collected monthly, quarterly, yearly, and you can read more about this in Box 4.4 and Table 4.5 in the textbook. Once the consumer price index is calculated, calculating the inflation rate is a simple growth calculation. So if you want to calculate the inflation rate for 2004, you would say, let's take 96,9, the CPI in 2004, minus 92.3, which is the CPI in 2003, divided by the older number of the two, 92.3, times 100, and that would give an inflation rate of more or less 9,4%. Where inflation is about internal stability in the economy, the balance of payments is all about external stability. It is an accounting record of all the transactions that we have with the rest of the world. So South African households, firms and the government have transactions with households, firms and governments in the rest of the world. And all this is accounted for in the balance of payments. There are two main accounts, the financial and current account. The current account looks at the flows of goods and services. There's a surplus if exports are greater than imports, and a deficit when the exports are smaller than the imports. Typically, these real transactions need to be balanced out by what happens in the financial account. These reflect financial flows, where foreign investors buy bonds in the South African bond market or shares, that means that there's an inflow of foreign currency into the South African economy. Where South Africans take their money and invest it abroad, that means it's an outflow. Typically, if you have a deficit on the current account, like we have in South Africa, it's important to have a surplus in the financial account to fund that deficit. The final macro goal that we consider is the distribution of income in an economy. We can talk a lot about income inequality and inequalities in wealth, but this chapter focuses mainly on the measurement of inequality. One way to do it is the so-called Lorenz curve. This is a visual illustration of income inequality. What it shows is that you draw on the horizontal axis the cumulative percentage of incomes, and on the Vertical access, the cumulative percentage of the population earning those incomes. What you end up with is a diagonal line representing an equal distribution of income and a grey area representing inequality in the economy. Let's have a look. Measurements from, for example, the Income and Expenditure Survey or even the Census would show that the poorest 20% of the population earn approximately 3% of the income. The next 20 earn 7%. Now, cumulatively, that means that the poorest 40% of the population earns 10% of all incomes, 3 and 7. In this way, you stack up the cumulative portions of population and the share of income that they earn. By the time that you get to the richest 20%, they get 50% of all the incomes in the economy. Now let's have a look at what it looks like on the graph. As we saw in the table, the poorest 20% of the population earn more or less 3% of the incomes in this economy. That puts them over there. The next 20% earn 7% of the incomes. Cumulatively added to the 3, that puts you at 10% of incomes. And so you stack up the different points, C and D, through to over here, the top where you have both the 100% of income and 100% of population. And this gray area over here represents inequality, where the diagonal line represents an equal distribution of income, where 60% of the population would be earning 60% of incomes. In our case, that's not true. 60% of the population earns a lot less. The end result is that the Lorenz Curves gives you a quick visual presentation of inequality. The further the curve is away from the diagonal, the greater the inequality in this economy. The alternative is to calculate the Gini coefficient. It is derived from the Lorenz Curve by taking the area of inequality 
and dividing that surface by the surface of the bottom triangle. The Gini coefficient then ends up as a number between 1 and 0. If income is equally distributed, the Gini is close to 0. If income is unequally distributed, the Gini is close to 1. We will typically not ask you to calculate the Gini coefficient, but rather to interpret the value. So did we achieve the outcomes of this section? Can you calculate the unemployment rate? Can you calculate the inflation rate? Can you draw a Lorenz curve? And can you interpret the Gini coefficient? For more information, you can look at Chapter 4 in Moore and Furi, and there are additional resources available on your fundi. Answer the quiz questions. And finally, follow at Econuum on Twitter.